So I'll put that there. <sighs> Hello, friends. Hello, love. <laughs> So I'm going to start with the exact same sentence that my father started with, which is, let the group know the vivid, flaming, drenching life that floods the fourth when the fifth is known. But I will go in an entirely different direction. <laughs> So that, that, it's such a beautiful phrase, let the group know the vivid, flaming, drenching life that floods the fourth when the fifth is known, when the kingdom of the souls is known in the kingdom of humanity, what will happen. And I want today to have a rather experiential journey using poetry, using a felt sense of what that might experience might be like in an ongoing uh, path. And I want to start by telling you a story. So, uh, 10 years ago, I went to Byron Bay, Australia for uh, a workshop. Yes. And it was a life changing moment. And I brought my dear friend Elizabeth with me. And we spent two weeks clearing obstruction to love, I guess I would say. <laughs> And it was so heightened and delicious and expansive and hard. And every picture from that entire trip, I'm standing like this. <laughs> like every time we're like, let's take a picture. <gasps> you know, it's like this feeling of just wanting to breathe in and stay open and uh, feel one with. And it was a doorway into a whole different way of living. I would say that that moment was a, a life-changing moment. And so, do you know, as we left that conference, we left with the sense that love was all that mattered and that love was eternal and we would carry that. We would carry that in a radical way so that it would bust through the obstructions that we create, the obstructions externally. We walked out sort of fiercely. And we went to visit two dear friends. Some of you know David Tresemer and Leela Tresemer. They, live, they lived on this tiny island, Flinders, south of um, Australia, an hour off the coast. And we decided if we were in Australia, we should go see them. And it was an hour flight. And we got there and we got on this little plane. It was a little plane. <laughs> and we sort of said hello to the pilot. And we were the only ones on the plane. And I have no great love of planes. <laughs> And I sort of said, okay, I've just come out of this workshop. I'll just breathe love the whole time and, you know, force myself to look at the choppy ocean below. And off we went. And there was just like a little purple um, uh, curtain between us and the pilot. With You could see the pilot. So we're flying, 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 50 minutes into it, you know, 10 minutes to go. And I start to see the pilot do, do this with this gear shift it looked like in the plane. <laughs> you know, mm, mm, and I, I sort of looked over at Elizabeth and mm, mm, like this, and kept looking. And uh, he finally reached to the glove compartment of the plane and took out the manual. <laughs> at which point, I, my heart sank to my belly. And I, I, I looked at Elizabeth and I, I sort of, we, did, we just didn't even communicate, we just sort of looked at each other and I finally said, uh, excuse me, is there something wrong? <laughs> and he said, um, we're going to turn around and fly back to Melbourne. And that's all he said. So I thought, okay, this is it. And I looked to Elizabeth and she looked at me and she grabbed my hand and she looked with such a ferocity of love and she nodded her head and we took a breath together and we looked forward and we held hands, I think, a good chunk of the way and then we went down. I mean, we, we went down <laughs> and I'm strangely here. Um, no, but, but no, we got to, and then we finally asked him, we said, what's, what's, wh what, what is going on? And he said, well, I'm not sure that the landing gear is working and because Flinders is such a tiny island, nobody's at the airport, so they can't tell me if it's working or not. So we flew back to Melbourne, they looked, the landing gear was working, it was an electric circuit that was a problem, we landed. I got off, I kissed the ground, I shook, they fed us lunch, 
They said, now you got to get back on again. I almost threw up. I got back on. <laughs> we flew back and we landed. Okay. So that was a rather vivid experience for me. Now, we got there and uh, David immediately took us, David and Leela took us to their property. And on their property, there was a gigantic fire. And it was on purpose. Um, it was a brush fire that they were burning something. And it was, I swear to you, it was like a 40 foot wall of flame. And this was, I'm like, oh, your property's really nice and you have a fire on your property. You know, it looks like, um, still shaking from the plane. And I saw this wall of flame and I looked at Elizabeth and David had gone off somewhere. I looked at Elizabeth and I looked at Leela and we said, there's nothing to do but take off all our clothes and stand in front of the fire <laughs> and take pictures of each other going, oh, you know, which is what we did, of course, wouldn't you? Um, and <laughs> the pictures are rather intense, but we, <laughs> There was really this urge to just strip and stand there and feel the heat at our backs and feel, I mean, you could, the, the flame was above us and it was, it, it, it was, it was flaming and we, we did that and we breathed that in and then we went and had lunch and then we, then we um, proceeded to the ocean. And, uh, and I'm not making this up. So then we, we proceeded to the ocean just several hours later. There was a gigantic boulder. David said, I love to climb up this boulder and stand here and wit, you know, look out at the ocean. It's the best view. Let's do it. We climb up. We're standing on top of the ocean. I mean, we're standing on top of the boulder. And a moment later, this gigantic wave went and it, it drenched us, drenched us. And David was like, whoa, that never happens. So we were standing there like, shock, you know, all of that. So we were rather drenched. So as you can imagine, these three events on that day became rather like touchstones for the vivid, flaming, drenching life. <laughs> and you know, the vivid, the vivid plane, that moment of eternity, that moment of love, uh, busting through time, that moment when nothing else matters if you see love pouring through the eyes of a beloved, uh, the eyes as the vehicle for the soul, the moment when there's absolute trust because there's nothing to do but love. And there's something, I know you've all had a moment like this where it's just the vividness of knowing that love is unceasing and carries us through time. The flames, wanting the heat at our back, wanting the intensity, wanting to be food for the fire, wanting to burn to the essential, wanting to get rid of anything that obstructs the heat. The drenching, for me, this touchstone of the drenching, if you are drenched by love, don't dry off. You know? Like, shake, shake the, the love onto anyone you meet, but stay drenched. <laughs> and, 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 and I also would say of that moment, the shock of love, the shock of the immensity of love, and how you let that shock move through you and stay with you and continue to allow it to awaken you even in the mundane moments, that, that it actually is like an electric current in you that at, at any moment that, that it can, you can tap into. So these three moments for me are, are, are texturally reminders of this, this kingdom of the soul. What could this be like? So of course the next question is, okay, you have a day like that, and then how do you take it into the rest of your life, right? Uh, besides having someone douse you with water, cold water occasionally or something. But, um, and it's going to sound strange or not, but I think that one of the ways to carry that vivid, flaming, drenching energy into your life is to be willing to be the body, to be a body, <laughs> to be a body embodied. I'm interested in embodiment, to be a flexible vessel for this intensification to pour through, to actually be, be able to use this vehicle to, to 
blend with, to morph with this higher energy. After all, guess what? The fifth kingdom needs our bodies. It needs the fourth kingdom. We are, we are providing the vehicle for this to come through. We are, in some ways, it's a sacrificial act to provide the body for this energy to come through. So it, there's something about the willingness at any moment to, to see what is needed physically to meet this energy. So you know I'm a poet. I love poetry. Um, but I didn't memorize them this time. <laughs> This is a poem by Linda Hogan that I think speaks to what I'm, I'm trying to get at, and it's called The Way In. Sometimes the way to milk and honey is through the body. Sometimes the way in is a song. But there are three ways in the world, dangerous, wounding, and beauty. To enter stone, be water. To rise through hard earth, be plant, desiring sunlight, believing in water. To enter fire, be dry. To enter life, be food. Yeah? So many pieces of this I love, but to enter life be food. Let this body be the food. Let this body be the water over the stone. Let this body change so that this, this higher life can pour through. And I love this, um, you know, sometimes the way to milk and honey is through the body. Sometimes the way in is a song. It reminds me of singing with Harold yesterday. For whatever reason, it was just well, pouring through, yeah? So, uh, and I, and this point, there are three ways in the world, dangerous, wounding, and beauty. Dangerous, that, that fear, wounding, the pain. We have all a lot of that, yes, fear and pain. But beauty, the choice of beauty, the choice to the Venusian aspect that we've been bringing in this entire pre-conference and conference is like, how are you going to see the world with intelligent love, one hopes, from the Ajna, from the position of the knower, and to, to yes, to, to live with and walk with fear and pain. You, you can't eradicate those, but you can stand in beauty and enter the world in your beauty and walk into the world with beauty and choose to see beauty. So to use our eyes, the physical being, to choose to see beauty, not only these eyes, but this eye, yeah? So I love that. And of course, you know, the natural world, um, I had this vivid, flaming, drenching life through the natural world, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm deeply interested in looking out to the natural world for a guide, but how, how do we do this? How do we do this path? How do we, how do we walk this path of light? And it's funny because when Claire was speaking yesterday and the caterpillar came up, the woolly bear caterpillar, right? I was like, I'm thinking about caterpillars too. And, um, and I, really, I really was, um, I've become fascinated with the metamorphosis process because it's so, it's such a crazy metaphor, okay? So I just want to tell you, I mean, most of you know the cocoon and all of that, but I just want to whisper some of this into your ear about, about this process because it speaks so much to our own path. So like little caterpillar's born, he eats his egg, then he eats everything in sight. Do you know like the very hungry caterpillar book by the little by Eric Carle where he eats all the salami and the, yes, that's right. So he eats everything in sight. He, he, his skin does not grow with him, right? So ever, the, the, the caterpillar is always growing out of its skin and a new skin is always growing underneath and there's a liquid in between the two skins so that the first molting process, the, the inner skin goes out and the outer skin sheds and it's, it's called molting. And by the way, when a caterpillar is born, it's called a first in star. That's what it's called, a first in star. It molts five times. The first in star, the second in star, the third in star, the fourth in star, and the fifth in star is when it actually forms the chrysalis, okay? It, um, it, when, it, when it decides it's time to form the chrysalis, it climbs onto the branch. 
It attaches all its suction cups, and, you know, tentacles or whatever they are, and then, they mu and then he must let go of every single one except the feet, the little toes. So he has to let go, fall backwards and upside down. Okay, shoom, backwards and upside down into the unknown. At which point, something like his head falls off <laughs> and a chrysalis starts to form with the fifth molting. The fifth molting. And this, it, it's um, in many species, in many forms of the uh, caterpillar to the butterfly, it's like a green with gold and black. And it's, it, it becomes a transparent thing. And it's about 10 days that the butterfly is in it. And the butterfly's colors start to show through the chrysalis. It becomes transparent. So at first it's just mute. It's, it's very soft and you can't really see it. And then it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you almost see the entire butterfly. Um, and But by the way, before that, let me say, the caterpillar gets cons it, it goes to liquid. It gets consumed by its own juices. It, it, it's liquefied, except for a few little cells that are called imaginal cells. And out of that, the butterfly is formed. So da 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 da, 10 days, it emerges. Butterflies always emerge in the morning. Yay. So it emerges, its wings are wet. It has to pump liquid from the abdomen to the wings, and then it has to practice flight. because It stretches out the wings, and then it must practice flight. So, right? I mean, I don't think I need to go through and sort of point out the, um, the resonances, but what a beautiful journey through these five moltings, through this beauty starting to pour through this, this um, structure that then is broken out of, and this being is freed, yeah? And I don't know, uh, Goethe, Goethe has a beautiful poem, M maybe some of you know at least one line from this, called, it's called The Holy Longing. Who, he, he certainly presents as the butterfly here and our journey. Tell a wise person or else keep silent because the mass man will mock it right away. I praise what is truly alive, what longs to be burned to death. In the calm water of the love nights where you were begotten, where you have begotten, a strange feeling comes over you when you see the silent candle burning. Now you are no longer caught in the obsession with darkness and a desire for higher lovemaking sweeps you upward. Distance does not make you falter. Now, arriving in magic, flying, and finally insane for the light, you are the butterfly and you are gone. And as long as you haven't experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. Yeah. And it's so long as you haven't experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. And there's something about each of us with this silent candle burning, yearning for the light, all moving towards the center. And there's something about the willingness to die. <laughs> and of course, the caterpillar's molting process, in a way, is a continual shedding and a continual dying and a continual willingness to release what no longer serves us to let in the flaming, drenching, vivid life, to let in the, to, to eliminate the obstruction so that we can make room for the light. So, as uncomfortable as it is, or as in intense as it is to welcome, we, we, we welcome the death process in all areas of our life. You know, my, my husband is obsessed with Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> um, and he just put out a new album, and over now 17 years with him, um, I've, I've had to come around and like start to listen to Bruce Springsteen. Um, but he, he's wonderful, actually. He's a poet. He's now in his early 60s. He's, he's actually got um, an incredible wisdom about him. And um, this, this whole album is called The Wrecking Ball. And he has one song on the album called The Wrecking Ball. And it's about Giant Stadium that, is, that I don't know if it's already been destroyed. I think it has to make room for a parking lot. 
and you know he as a young musician played at Giant Stadium, and uh, the, you know the glory of youth, the glory, the beauty, the beauty of these days. He has a line in it where he says, "Where the giants played the games." And of course, it even makes me think of the hidden history of humanity because the giants used to play the games, right? But so anyway, the giant, where the giants played the games, and he wrote this song because a lot of the fans were outraged that the, this gorgeous stadium was being torn down because there's so many memories and so much glory and so many victories, and how could you do this? So he sings to that, but at a certain moment, it begins this, I mean, I, I just listen to it repeated, repeatedly because it becomes this anthem of bring on your wrecking ball bring on your wrecking ball. And he's just like, bring it on. And he's like, boom. And it's when Keith was playing last night, it was boom, the, the, the gong. I was like, bring on your wrecking ball. And it's, it's something to, say, to invoke that. But it's like, bring on the wrecking ball to the parts that aren't working. Bring it on. Like, let's get, let's, you know, let's do this thing. <laughs> so because then you can, then you can make, then you can truly be drenched and flaming and vivid. So, you know, and, and, and there's a part in the song where it's good times come and good times go and good times come and good times go. And, you know, he just, he really carries the fourth ray with him too. But in any case, it's like, yes, let's do that. <laughs> so, but it's hard to welcome that, isn't it? And, and this poem in, particularly, in particular, Marie Howe, she speaks to, you know, we come to these amazing convocations, these amazing conferences, you know, and then I'm sure many of you have had the experience about going back out into the world and, you know, 24 hours later being like, oh, oh you know, and just also like, and now what? I'm supposed to write a book, okay? Or what? I'm, you know, right. So she speaks to the daily experience and in a way, the trap and the pain of the daily experience or how easy it is to deflect. You know, for those of you that were at the pre the Seven Ray seminar, you know, there was this, we did these dialogues between the soul and the personality where for each ray, the personality deflects the soul in some way. I'm too busy, you know, I, I'm pathetic, I can't listen to you, you know, all of the ways that we deflect. And I think that this poem speaks to that. Uh, it's called Prayer by Marie Howe. Every day I want to speak to you. Every day I want to speak with you. And every day something more important calls for my attention. The drugstore, the beauty products, the luggage I need to buy for the trip. Even now, I can hardly sit here among the falling piles of paper and clothing the garbage trucks outside already screeching and banging. The mystics say you are as close as my own breath. Why do I flee from you? My days and nights pour through me like complaints and become a story I forgot to tell. Help me. Even as I write these words, I am planning to rise from the chair as soon as I finish this sentence. My days and nights pour through me like complaints and become a story I forgot to tell. The story we want to tell is not a story of complaint, is it? We want to tell the story of the flaming, drenching, vivid life. And I suppose it requires a certain amount of sitting still inwardly or outwardly to do that. So, It becomes an ongoing inner meditation, in a way, to be steeped inwardly in the flaming, drenching, vivid life and pour it out through whatever it is we do, the daily task, and to let that energy impress itself through the daily task and not let the daily task deflect the impression. Yeah? And even if we're resistant, even we can be conscious of our resistance and, the, and that, that, that kingdom, the, the soul texture can still be present. And even if others are resistant to, we stand, in, we stand steeped in that life. 
and we can watch all the resistance and we can watch all the obstruction, but we press, we press that beauty and love and wisdom through with every step. You know, I, often when I'm getting manic and manic and manic, I'll just stop and walk slowly from here to there and feel the blessing of the feet and feel the gratitude of the walk and feel the breath of the present moment and return to myself. And this poem speaks to that so beautifully that, um, yeah, I don't even need to say anything else about it, but it's called Ironing Their Clothes. And it's by Julia Alvarez. And as I read this, it is so, it's so much about a mundane task, but I want you to feel the impression of the kingdom of the souls working through cloth. With a hot glide up, then down his shirts, I ironed out my father's back, cramped and worried with work. I stroked the yoke, the breast pocket, collar and cuffs, until the rumpled heap relaxed into the shape of my father's broad chest. The shoulders shrugged off the world, the collapsed arms spread for a hug. And if there'd been a face above the button-down neck, I would have pressed the forehead out. I would have made a boy again out of that tired man. If I clung to her skirt as she sorted the wash or put out a line, my mother frowned, a crease down each side of her mouth. This is no time for love. But here, I could linger over her wrinkled bed jacket, kiss at the damp puckers of her wrists with the hot tip. Here I caressed complications of darts, scallops, ties, pleats, which made her outfits test the patience of my passion. Here I could lay my dreaming iron on her lap. The smell of baked cotton rose from the board and blew with a breeze out the window to the family wardrobe drying on the clothesline, all needing a touch of my iron. Here I could tickle the underarms of my big sister's petticoat or secretly pat the backside of her pajamas. For she too would have warned me not to muss her fresh blouses, starched jumpers and smocks. All that my careful hand had ironed out, forced to express my excess love on cloth. I love that poem. <laughs> because we, we can be, we can be the heat of the soul pressed into whatever medium, whatever person, whatever moment. It, it doesn't even, the moment doesn't even have to allow it. Right? Because we all have the experience of the family clothesline and the family that, you know, that you can't necessarily press your, your love in or, or presence the soul as easily. And there's something beautiful about whatever medium will take it as an, and, and, and will stand in the world as an expression of it. And it's even our own, you know, in this, it's the mother, the father, the sisters, but it's even our own resistance as the personality to receive the press of the iron, the press of that love through our own vehicles, because there's always some, no, obstruction, some resistance, some un something uncomfortable. But the iron working through daily with precision, with, with, with gratitude, with love. So to me, that poem is just like a, a, a wonderful touchstone for how we can move through our lives, presencing the, the flaming, drenching, vivid life, but then doing the mundane task. And 
and letting the fullness, I mean, can you feel her full, the fullness of the love through, through this simplicity? Yeah. So what does it begin to look like then, you know, uh, for us as we, the, the, the sentence is, let the group know, let the group know the vivid, flaming, drenching life. And I, I, I keep having an image, and it's a very simple image, but of course it's the image of all of us walking like rays of the sun, like walking in on the rays of the sun almost, to the center point, and to all of us doing the work, all of us doing the work of being food for the fire, all of us doing the work of being drenched with love, all of us doing the work of, of daily presencing the kingdom of the soul, all of us walking increasingly infused. And then we arrive at this center point, and at this center point, then we invoke the group soul. And because of the work we've each individually done, and, and can, I mean, can you even feel as these conferences build, clearly we've done more and more work and something else is happening because each of us individually have done more and more work and we continue to come back to the circle and it's the circle that never leaves. So we step back into the circle that never, you know, it closes and opens and closes and opens and so we walk back into the center and we invoke the group soul and we steep in that, we steep in the group soul and then when we turn back it's a dip it's a different texture entirely because it's not just the individual process it's the group process that we're carrying and we we turn we rotate out we focus to the world and we 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 walk differently having steeped within the group energy having steeped within the group soul and i and i want to just uh I want to share one more poem which speaks to what it might feel like us for us individually just as we're about to enter this circle. What is it to, to really come be at home as the soul infused personality in a way? And this is, um, it's her vision, her, it's her version of the vivid flaming drenching life and it's this, uh, the, po the poet is Fleur Adcock and she is, you know, I think now she's in her 70s and she spent a year alone in the Lake District, and for her it was a life-changing time where everything else fell away. And though this poem doesn't sound so dramatic, you can feel the richness of her life. And you can feel the moment when we say, nothing but soul, like nothing but living that way, all right? And it's called weathering, weathering. My face catches the wind from the snow line and flushes with a flush that will never wholly settle. Well, that was a metropolitan vanity, wanting to look young forever to pass. I was never a pre-Raphaelite beauty and only pretty enough to be seen with a man who wanted to be seen with a passable woman. But now, now that I am in love with a place that doesn't care how I look and if I am happy, Happy is how I look, and that's all. My hair will grow gray in any case. My nails chip and flake, my waist thicken, and the years work all their usual changes. If my face is to be weather-beaten as well, it's little enough lost for a year among the lakes and vales where simply to look out my window at the high pass makes me indifferent to mirrors and to what my soul may wear over its new complexion. So I would suggest to us that, but now that I am in love with a place that doesn't care how I look and if I am happy, that that place is the place of the group gathered together in love. Now that I am in love with that place, now that I am in love with the flaming, drenching, vivid life, what does it matter if my f face is swept with the wind and my waist thickened, you know? It's like, it's this beautiful release into a flow and into a, uh, a presence where you're just doing your work and you're, and you're offering your gift and you're offering yourself generously. Yeah. So 
I want to leave with one, one sentence. And I want to, you know, as I, I work on these talks over, you know, they, they, they sort of, they, they, they stay with me over months and I'm walking along and I write, write a little note and, you know, and I, I have this beautiful book of sacred poetry that I look through and this book I've had for years, but I, and I always skip certain page, you know, I always skip certain pages and at the, however, this time, this particular line stood up, stood out. And it's actually by a, a woman poet, Rabia. She's an Islamic poet. She was born 500 years before Rumi and Rumi loved her poetry. And it, this line, I kept, oh yeah, whatever, okay, yeah. It's, just, it's a one line poem, okay. But this time it arrested me and I would like us to feel the resonance of it. And it's just called One Day. One day he did not leave after kissing me. And I want you to consider <laughs> that one day he did not leave after kissing me could be as the kiss of the group soul, the kiss of the flaming, drenching, vivid life, the kiss of the love that we form together that doesn't have to go away and we do not have to abandon it. It can stay close to us. It can stay one with us. It can stay as us. And the sweetness of that and the union of that and the presence of that, I invite us all to welcome. Thank you so much.